Welcome back to Straightforward Levant TV's political debate show. Three years of war in Syria and the conflict is ongoing. Three long years and the president is staying. 9,000 balloting points around the country and refugee camps where the 73% of Syrian voters had their say and 88.7% of, the, of them have chosen Dr. Bashar al-Assad as their president for another term. How did the election go and what's next? What's going to change? How is the world going to look at it? How is the foreign-backed opposition going to look now? Let me first welcome our guests at the studio, Dr. Abdurrahman Jamil, uh, British Iraqi politician, and Mr. Stephen Bell of uh, the Stop the War Coalition. Thank you very much for coming to our studios. And before we delve into the electoral framework, let's have a look at this report, where Levant TV had exclusive footage of what is happening on ground in various parts of Syria. Tens of thousands of Syrians headed to the polls on Tuesday to cast their ballot in the presidential election, which is likely to see President Bashar al-Assad win another term. President Assad, the First Lady Asma al-Assad and Foreign Minister Walid al-Muallim, among other politicians, were also seen casting their votes. At a polling station in the Ministry of Information in Damascus, state employees described the election as a huge event, which would help build what terrorism has destroyed. This huge event, the day of the Syrian presidential election, is a national and constitutional duty. We want to choose the doctor who can treat the illness Syria is suffering from and can find the right treatment for this disease. This cooperation between Syrians is meant to build the country after over 85 countries around the world have tried to destroy it. This cooperation between Syrians today is meant to build what terrorism has destroyed. Some Syrians stamped their ballots with blood after pricking their fingers with pins supplied by the government in a symbolic act of allegiance and patriotism. I made a fingerprint with blood on my voting ballot for President Bashar al-Assad because he is the only one who can help us out of this crisis. We are all by his side to rebuild Syria and become better and better. Election is a constitutional right for every Syrian citizen who is proud of his nationality. This election came at a very sensitive period of time and it is necessary so that all Syrian citizens can vote and show the world what Syria is all about. All citizens should participate to choose the right president at the right time. We as Syrian mothers are feeling the importance of this event more than anyone. Today, we're electing a new Syria, and we're witnessing the birth of a new Syria. It's true that we feel pain, pain for the martyrs and pain for the destruction that has happened because of the terrorist militias. But as always, the joy of birth and the happiness you feel when you see a newborn makes you forget the pain. The election today is a democratic turning point in the history of modern Syria. Today is very important and every ballot box represents a bullet in the face of the enemy. Whoever conspired against Syria is now waiting for the results of this election and the results will definitely be in the favor of the people and the country. The atmosphere in Homs and Dara was just as patriotic. We are the citizens of Homs. We are here to participate in the public celebration because it is the real democracy and we want to teach the whole world that in Syria there is true democracy, while they lack the simplest means of democracy. We participate in this public celebration because we want a unified Syria government by President Bashar al-Assad, because Syria is facing the imperial system and we will participate in the election because Syrians taught pride resilience and democracy to the world. We came here to ensure our belonging to this country, to Syria, to ensure our loyalty to this country and to say yes to the presidential election. Syrian presidential candidate Hassan al-Nuri cast his vote at a polling station in the Sheraton Hotel in central Damascus. Nuri held a press conference in the same location after casting his vote, saying that the elections mark a new era. Today in Syria, we have started a new era the era of true victory over terrorism and this global war. Syria has won with the will of its people and the great Syrian army. I, as a presidential candidate of the Syrian Republic, have voted for myself, of course. I declare that if it was not for the strength of the great people of Syria, we would not have got to this day. We stand here among all of you voting for the new president of this country among the will of Syrians and the strength of Syrians and thank you. 
Stephen Bell, why do you think this election still took place despite Ban Ki-moon's suggestion not to go ahead with it? I think in the absence of progress on the Geneva II uh, process, it was inevitable that the regime would seek to consolidate its uh, position given the fact that it has been making substantial military progress in recent months. I have to say I find uh, Ban Ki-moon's uh, uh, approach um, far from helpful insofar as that um, the whole Geneva process is premised on uh, a, a parity of esteem between the, uh, 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 the different sides. And if the decision to proceed with the presidential election um, is against the Geneva process, then how would one characterize President Obama's speech indicating uh, increased uh, support for the uh, armed opposition. Surely that should also be understood. Mm -hmm. um, as it is, we have to say, it was inevitable that um, such a, uh, given no progress on Geneva, well, then President uh, Assad is going to say can you to can the world, I, I have a substantial amount of support, um, especially as so many uh, Western politicians have insisted he has none. Can you elaborate a little bit, just briefly, on the parity of esteem at the UN? Well, in, 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 um, parity, in, in terms of the Geneva process, it's quite clear that all parties in the uh, process should feel that they are able to make uh, um, uh, progress and that there should not be a threat to uh, uh, anyone in the uh, uh, process, the necessity for the um, violence to end and for there to be uh, moves towards transitional government, transitional process, etc., etc. All of this is, uh, of course, well un understood, but you have to have an agreement mm -hmm. um, that peace is going to be struggled for. Yes. Dr. Jamil, had the election not taken place, what are the risks of going into an interim presidency in Syria? I think nothing would have changed. Nothing. I mean, whether there's election or no election, um, the regime tries whatever it could to stay in power. Could you still to call it a regime? The media refers to The regime, to it I, mean, as a I, mean regime. The, I mean, the family, the family that rules you know, Syria for the last 40 years, you know, they still want to rule maybe, maybe for the next generation. This is the process. I think, I think uh, uh, it is for Bashar al-Assad, you know, at the beginning when, when, when the whole thing started, you know, three years ago, he could have, I wouldn't say give in, but at least to show some kind of willingness, you know, to solve the problem peacefully rather than just like Gaddafi. You know, Gaddafi he kept telling them, you are rats, you are blah, blah, blah. And what happened? They were, he was killed, like Saddam, you know, the same thing. Uh, so are I we think, comparing here? To, I, I'm not comparing, but I'm, I'm, you know, this is, this is the, 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 the equation, I would say. You know, okay, you are a ruler, you have been in the, in, 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 in the power, you know, from your father without being elected, without being, uh, you know, just, you know, from the mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. And then, and then something happens mm -hmm. among the people. I think the best thing would have been is just to sit yes. down and say, look, what do you want? Okay, you want power, power sharing? Okay, maybe I'll give you part of it. Yes. We are joined now by uh, Dr. Uh, Declan Hayes joining us live from Syria. Thank you very much for being on Straightforward. Dr. Hayes, uh, what was the situation uh, during the election day and how would observers like yourself uh, uh, comment on it? Were you present in more than one area? Okay, I was in Damascus and Harms and I was in Damascus last night when the result came through. Now, there were three candidates. As everybody knows, President Assad won overwhelmingly. But I think every vote was a vote for peace and a vote for Syria. So President Assad has a big mandate. The enemies of Syria have no mandate. Some of them, like Saudi Arabia, do not even have a mandate in Saudi Arabia. So the people of Syria have spoken and the enemies of Syria should respect that. The enemies of Syria responded last night with mortar fire. Uh, we could hear it last night. But the people of harm that I spoke to, all of them voted for President Assad. Mm. 
and uh, Dr. Hayes, where, where people forced to go and elect by, by the use of weapon and threatening them as, as some media is claiming here in the West. What do you have to say about that? Look, um, I, I read the BBC report and again, they were totally stupid and totally uh, without foundation. I, I met old ladies who could hardly walk going in to vote, okay? Uh, now, as the BBC telling me that President Assad made those very old ladies go in to vote, are they that stupid? Are they telling us that President Assad made hundreds of thousands of people in Beirut go in to vote? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was in many areas and they all wanted to vote, um, I asked them after they came out, I said, why did you vote for President Assad? I got several reasons. The major reason was security. So if you can imagine England under attack and suicide bombers in London, in Birmingham, in Manchester, of course people would vote yes. for the security candidates. Yes, Dr. So Hayes, as an independent observer in Syria, did you witness and did you did you think of this election as a transparent now, election that? generally? What? Dr. Hayes, as an independent observer who was in Syria in different areas, would you comment on this election and say perhaps that it was generally transparent? Well, you know, look, I the army are doing the fighting here, and the army are paying a very big price for, for that. So the ordinary people, the old ladies, the young ladies, the old men, they got their chance yesterday, and they, or rather uh, the day before, and they sent a message out clearly, a message for peace, a message for the independence of Syria, and a message that President Assad, yes. in their opinion, is the best man to, to, to get peace for Syria and a future for Syrians. Yes, Dr. Hayes, one last question. Uh, were there more observers, independent observers like yourself in Syria, and would they share, would they agree, do you think, with what you are saying? Well, I mean, the people of Syria celebrated last night with gunfire. I don't agree with that. But today, today it's, 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 back, it's back to normal. People are, um, you know, working and so on. So look, the message is very simple. If, if, if the enemies of civilization, if they leave Syria alone... Who are Syria these enemies, uh, Dr. Ducklin? The way it was. Who are these enemies um, of civilization, the as you say? enemies of Syria have no mandate. Huh? You mentioned the enemies of civilization. Who are these, namely? Well, well we know who they are. They're Saudi Arabia, Turkey, um, Britain, France, the United States. Um, yes. Uh, all right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so they they are the enemies. They are the enemies uh, of Syria. They have no mandate in Syria they should leave Syria alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ducklin Hayes, Senior Fellow at the University of Southampton, thank you very much for your participation live from Syria. Oh, okay, thanks mm. a lot, bye-bye. And uh, Dr. Uh, Jamil, can I ask you, the West denies its presence in Syria in terms of observers, yet we all know that Syrian hotels are packed with Westerners who are there under other missions. What do you think of this? This is very customary of the Arab regimes. I say regime, I don't say governments because mm -hmm. they are not, uh, I mean, they were not, uh, at least in the past, you know, they were not, uh, you know, elected by the people. It's usually they bring, you know, people who they know, even journalists, journalists who at least have a leaning toward them. So they bring them to their hotel, they pack the hotels, even they make them, you know, go around in the street and just try to, try to, Try to what? Try to make them, I would say, make them write something, something positive. 
Um, this happens, you know, I, you know, because I've been in, in similar situations, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, even during the, um, you know, the war in Iraq, I was there. I was with the CNN, mm-hmm. and uh, and they were forcing, you know, journalists to write what they want them to write, and they even have some kind of censorship on the reports that they send back to their to their home. Mm-hmm. So I think here we are talking about, uh, you know, I, I'm not trying to, you know, hair splitting here, but this is a situation in the Arab world. Every government, I would say then the government, they try to defend themselves in any way possible, in any way possible. And I think what happens in Syria is that, you know, Assad government, okay, they try to establish themselves again as legitimate through the, uh, the elections. Mm-hmm. But I think this legitimacy is short-lived because why? I mean, it's not because the Syrian people were not... Um, uh, you know, loyal, uh, or they were not uh, uh, at least having the freedom to to cast their votes. It's half the country under under uh, you know under these uh, militants. You know, under these. Are you uh, talking people. about the rebels or the militants? Uh, you call them rebels. You call them whatever you want. People who who carry arms, mm-hmm. who are fighting against the government. Right. For God position? of reason, no. Yeah. I mean, for for reason we don't know. I mean, but there is a, there is a war in in Syria. There is a war. Whether we like it or not, there is a war. There is maybe there, there is huge participation. A war. A sectarian war in mm-hmm. Syria, as is the case with in Iraq, for example, there is a sectarian war, and in, in, in Lebanon, we are going to find another war. Okay, we're going to see another war. So the election at this time, at this time in Syria, will have an impact. Mm-hmm. And the first impact, in my opinion, is going to further intensify the sectarian war in, yes. the, in the region, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, even in, in maybe in Kuwait, maybe in, in Bahrain, maybe in Saudi Arabia. You mentioned force uh, from, from the regime or pressure when it comes to journalists or foreign observers. Uh, someone like uh, Dr. Hayes, uh, someone of his caliber who is an academic and who's there at his own will as an independent researcher, uh, he just uh, reported that I'm, I'm things not doubting, went... I'm not doubting his report, you know. I'm not doubting what he had seen, mm-hmm. but... Why does he the was, media he was doubt? In one place, maybe. He was in one place. Maybe no, he was in more than one place, okay. as he said, of course. But within, within Damascus, maybe, not, he went not to ha- further. He was in Hamas. Yeah, okay. He was actually reporting. Okay, never Hummus. mind. I'm not, I'm not discussing this mm-hmm. thing, but, but I think there are people yes. you know, who believe that if they don't say this, like, like Saudi Arabia, for example. Mm-hmm. If I talk against Saudi Arabia in this restaurant, you know, mm-hmm. here in this studio, I take something, maybe I say something bad against Saudi Arabia, maybe they won't let me in in the future because they know my name, you know. I'm not afraid to say that. I always am against Saudi Arabia. But, but the point is, people who have some kind of interest in Syria or in whatever country, they try always to avoid some kind of friction with the, with the authorities. Definitely. That's a point. I'm not, I'm not arguing about whether it was right or not. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is the point. Uh, Stephen Bell, uh, on this occasion, how could we balance the will of the Syrian people in relation to the agendas of the West? Isn't the West undermining the will of the Syrians by claiming the elections was, wasn't fair, knowing that a majority of the Syrians participated way more than the participation in Egypt, for instance, which was like a normal uh, rate of participation in Syria, was even more? Yes, yeah, so I think that the um, crisis in uh, Syria is in great part a result of um, mostly a covert uh, intervention by uh, Western powers. And I think that similarly the huge roadblock that's been erected in the development of uh, democracy in um, Egypt is exactly um, at the encouragement of uh, Western powers. In in my opinion, um, the traditions of imperialism are that um, you can have any regime in the Middle East providing it's friendly to Western interests. It doesn't matter what character, um, a regime which starts to splinter from those interests is liable to face serious um, subversion. And the fate of Dr. Morsi, uh, I think, is clearly, uh, President Morsi is clearly uh, an expression uh, of this. An astonishing thing, you're going to uh, outlaw the most popular party in Egypt in the name of democracy. Um, and I think it's interesting that um, the voting levels um, in Egypt in comparison to uh, Syria suggest, if anything, that there is more democracy in Syria given the vote against um, the uh, president in comparison to the vote against um, uh, President Sisi, who, after all, was only challenged by mm-hmm. someone who agreed mm-hmm. with the coup. Mm-hmm. Wasn't, it wasn't even facing a real... Uh, uh, um, opposition in that sense. Of course, as a activist in the Stop the World Coalition, 
This is our preoccupation, that the people of the Middle East have to have genuine self-determination. Whatever internal conflicts and problems, they can only be resolved by the people of the Middle East. And we are dedicated to ensuring that the British government and NATO and the American government allow, as far as we can, um, to, for the um, real processes mm -hmm. in the Middle East um, to uh, uh, come to fruition. Okay. And now let's talk to political analyst Nidal Naisi joining us over the phone live from al in Syria. Thank you very much, Mr. Naisi, for being on Straightforward. And as we know, you do support President Assad, so let me congratulate you today. Thank you very much. Congratulations to all the people, the free people of all over the world, to you and to all those who love Syria and to the real friends of Syria who stood by Syria all over uh, throughout this uh, crisis. Mr. Naisi, tell us more about the context of the election in your region particularly. Who was voting and who was not voting? And did fee people feel under pressure to vote for President Assad as the media in the West is claiming? Well, uh, first of, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, let me tell you that uh, Latakia uh, and the, the coastal uh, region in general, there was a peaceful uh, area and peaceful uh, places. There was uh, uh, no uh, fighting here uh, throughout the, the, the war, uh, the three years uh, war. And uh, people uh, felt, uh, in fact, uh, so easy and so relaxed uh, to go to, uh, to the election and to the uh, boxes outside. Uh, there was a very huge um, turnout, and uh, uh, I think most uh, people voted yes uh, for President Assad. They view him as uh, their savior, as a hero, as a national, as a national yes. hero here mm -hmm. in Syria. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that uh, this uh, huge uh, number of people could, uh, by any way, be forced to go out uh, to to Palos and to to vote for any anyone. In fact, there was uh, there were too many crowds uh, uh, all over uh, Latakia, as I witnessed and as I saw at that day. Uh, and I think uh, the, most people went uh, went uh, freely to 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 Palos. Yes. Uh, yes? Uh, Mr. Naisi, why do you think the opposition decided to boycott this election? Well, uh, opposition uh, know their their size. In fact, inside inside Syria, they uh, know that they don't have any representation uh, on the ground. They yes. uh, uh, knew beforehand that they will lose if they. Uh, uh, go to to or present any uh, uh, candidate for this uh, election, mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, and they are not free, in fact, to to go to election because you know they are uh, they are governed and uh, controlled uh, by the the, the, the so-called friends of Syria, the, these uh, uh, countries, the Western countries who cover and control the Western opposition. Mm -hmm. They can't. They don't have the decision. The free decision to go to 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 the uh, to the elections. So and that, just and uh, just before we finish, Mr. Naisi, how would you describe the situation today in Al Ladikiya? Are people uh, celebrating this uh, victory of Mr. Assad? Well, uh, it was a very great day. In fact, uh, people uh, didn't sleep all night. Uh, we have uh, heard a lot of uh, people chanting, dancing in the streets, and singing for President Assad, hailing this uh, victory and saying yes to, pre to President Assad. I, in fact, I couldn't sleep for a, a very late hour uh, in night. Nidal Aisi, political analyst and writer based in Al Ladikiya, thank you very much for your participation. Thank you very much, Mr. Kar. Thank you. Dr. Jamil, what do you think of what Mr. Naisi just told us from al -Adikiya? No, I, th I think it's understood, well understood, when, when a Ba'athist, you know, because uh, the guy is known as a Ba'athist, you know, member of the Ba'ath Party, ruling Syria. And uh, what do you expect him to, to say more than that? Um, okay, there might Your be... Your opinion, of course. There might, there might be some... There might be some truth in, in what he says, you know, there might be some transparency, some, there might be something, you know, people dancing. I know, I, I saw them on, on, on the TV, you know, dancing around, uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad uh, picture. Uh, but, uh, I mean, this reminds me that we didn't see any people or a group of people around the pictures of the other candidates. 
You know, we didn't see any of them. We don't know them. We, we, it never happened. Okay, even they got the least the least numbers of votes according to the uh, authorities in Syria. But what I'm trying to say is that you know this election, as I said, you know it's it's badly timed. This is not the, the right time for the elections. You what know, about Syria and the very difficult uh, situation. What about the constitutional uh, uh, right that this needs to take place in a certain time limit? Yeah, I mean, this, is not, this is not a big problem for the Syrian regime. You know, they can, they can amend everything, even, even his age. You know, when he was underage, you know, they, they, they even they extended his age in order to be legitimate to be a president. This is not a problem for the Arab world, in the Arab world, to be honest with you. You see, any, any, any law, they can twist it the way they like. This is a, this is, this mm -hmm. a, a fact, you know, we all agree to it. That, but what I'm trying to say is that in Syria, I think, I think there was a process. There was the Geneva, the Geneva 1, Geneva 2, whatever. And there's a process. All the parties, all the parties who are concerned you know, about the future of Syria, whether it's Russia, Iran, these are the main players, mm -hmm. Russia, Iran, there's Turkey, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Qatar and, and, and the Emirates, and there's also the United States and the rest of the Western countries. You know, they have an interest. Each one has an interest in this country, which way it should be heading. And, and the Syrian, of course, they have, I mean, the government has also... And the people. And the people. Yo, this is the, the point I'm trying to say is the people. Where are the people? They voted. Half of them, half of them, half of, half of them, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not happy with the figures, you know, they mentioned. They said that 30 million or whatever million or 10 million, 12 million. Uh, this can easily be said, but we, can, we have to prove it from an independent side. Are you and saying it's not a transparent uh, figure that, that was revealed 80%? No, I, I think the whole process is not transparent to me according to the standards. But I think, I think, you know, when one man only, he says, look, I'm the president, okay, love me, okay, die for me, you know, die for me, and everybody says on TV, hey, we die for you, we love you, we die for you, we are the president. I mean, but does that people, not challenge the... They don't show it, excuse me, they don't show it in a proper way, you know. People should know they're right. Do they have the right to choose? Do they have the right or the freedom to choose a, a, a candidate? I, I think it was all nominated the, by the, the government. The residents in Lebanon, for example, just to, uh, to be objective, I'm not talking about the ones in refugee camps, I'm talking about the residents in Lebanon who voted at the Syrian embassy in Beirut. Uh, I don't, do you think they were under pressure? In Beirut? Yes, or in the Italy or in Spain or in yeah. the countries where the embassy opened its doors for voting, mm -hmm. in Amman, in Jordan, for instance? No, I think just to, they try, maybe they try to show their allegiance to the, to the president. Why? Because they are thinking of going back to their home. And if that regime stays at home, they need some kind of guarantee. They were not against the regime. You see, this is a problem. People, sometimes simple people, you know, who are forced but to leave they their country, vote. they want some kind of guarantee that when they go back, they, they won't mm. be, you know, um, mm. persecuted for that. But would they not bring him down if they didn't vote? For instance, if all the expats in Europe or, or, or the Middle East did not vote for President Assad, would not, why would he they would worry win. if he he's would not win. president? Whether they, they voted or not, he would win. That's he true. is the only candidate. You remember mm. that? He is the only candidate. Well, and, two and other candidates, of course. Yeah. They are two other candidates this oh, time. Oh, come on. And Stephen Bell, could we say that the West and the regional Mideast powers get it wrong, got it wrong this time in the case of Syria, especially when it comes to the alternative they are su suggesting and supporting to rule the country, namely the Islamists who are a bit alien to the Syrian socio-political fabric? Well, I think it was evident last summer how wrong uh, both the British and the American governments had got it when uh, the British Parliament and the uh, American Congress refused to authorize the bombing of Syria, um, despite the um, evident enthusiasm of both governments to do that. Now, in that, in that instance, it was clear that the people of the country, expressed through uh, the Parliament and through uh, Congress, were much more savvy to what was uh, actually happening. Um, and now, despite the, that uh, clear um, decision of the legislatives, um, you have a position where both um, the uh, British and American governments are seeking to achieve the same ends by other means. They will, of course, be unsuccessful. It's quite clear what last summer's vote represented was a mm. decline mm -hmm. of Western influence. Did it affect the US policy as well, somehow? Well, it's huge, yes. I mean, the fact that... Um, uh, President Obama in his recent speech can still talk in terms of American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. but then stresses the significance of making alliances for American mm -hmm. foreign policy. But its most faithful ally, 
um, some would even say a subcontractor of um, US foreign policy in the Middle East, i.e. the British government, was unable to deliver, despite having a very substantial parliamentary majority. Um, so I think it's evident that that was a change in the situation which neither the British or American governments have really yet registered. Yes, they've made some tactical adjustments, but they have to face up to the fact that President Assad is not about to be overthrown by anyone, and that therefore they must re-engage seriously with the peace process. And that means these ultimatums and insistence upon preconditions for uh, resuming the uh, um, Geneva process have to be dropped. And I would say that you have a, an incredible position where in uh, Montreux, 40 countries were able to make statements in the um, Geneva process, but Iran weren't allowed to be there. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. you are going to have a, a genuine uh, peace process, then you have to have some of the most influential, uh, all of the most influential uh, countries in, involved in the uh, struggle there. Mm. Dr. Jamil, in the case of Egypt, uh, Morsi as an alternative didn't seem to have consensus eventually among the Egyptians. Would the same, uh, the same could have applied if an Islamist rule were to take over in Syria, but Syria has even a more sensitive issue with the minorities well rooted in the country, especially, uh, for instance, the Christians. So how safe it is to have a regime or a rule change in Syria? You see, the whole point, um, thank you for the for your comment, because you mentioned something which is really, in my opinion, very important. You see, the whole, the entire region now is on fire. Iran is a major player, very influential in the, in the, in the area. Yeah, very influential. And the Americans now, they realize that they have to approach Iran, because Iran is a major player. Of course, when you approach Iran, regardless of the issue you approach Iran with, I mean, whether it's a nuclear, uh, uh, facilities there, or whether it's the, 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 the policy, whether it's intervention in, in here and there and there. But I think, I think what is happening, that's why I said the impact of the elections in Syria, I mean the perpetuation of the regime, I mean Assad regime in Syria, if they stay there, he's staying and he's not going to leave the office, you know, for whatever reason, to whatever pressure coming, whether from United States, from the West, from mm -hmm. the rest of the Arab countries. But I think, I can this, would further intensify the conflict. You know, we are going to witness very yes. soon, very soon, excuse me, very soon, a conflict between Shia and Sunni. You know, the Sunni and the Shia are going to fight, and they will fight ferociously, and we'll see the results in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in is that, Jordan is that also, not foreign but not in Egypt. But not in Egypt, because Egypt, this issue is not very, you know, maybe they find something else, like, you know, the brotherhood, plus the, the secular or whatever, or the military. But here in, in this area, in this vital area, you know, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Jordan also is involved, plus Saudi Arabia, you know, and of course Bahrain and Kuwait, we are going to have an upheaval. Mm -hmm. This is my opinion. We are going to see bad days coming to this area. It's not like Arab Spring, but maybe it could be like, like Arab, Arab winter. But back to my question very briefly, is an Islamist rule, a change of rule to an Islamist state in Syria safe for the country and its minorities? No. Thank Never. You. Never. And when I say this, sorry, I don't mean that I, I believe in what the, the other side is doing, you know. Syria is divided now, you know, and this is, this is a manifestation of what is going on in the entire region, is a, a line which is now becoming a very sharp line between Sunni and Shia whether it's Assad, whether it is Maliki, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in Bahrain or in, in Saudi you, Arabia. Speaking of the rebels and some of the rebels, rebel factions, uh, be it the insurgents or, um, are these, do you call these, all of these Sunni, like? Yeah, they are all Sunnis. Sunni, but there's a difference between radical Sunni and moderate Sunni, like, like. Uh, levels, there are different levels, but they are all Sunni. They want the, they want the rule of Islam and the Sharia, you know? They want the Sharia to be the rule. Mm -hmm. they, they reject any kind of government, you know, from whoever, but they want, which is what they say, that's why they call mm -hmm. themselves the Islamic State of, of, of Iraq and, and Syria, you know? When, when, you, when you draw the line here between Shia and Sunni, are you suggesting somehow that the Alawites are the one behind Bashar al-Assad's victory today? Oh yes, it's very clear, very clear. 
I mean, uh, they they, yeah. they form five percent of the Shia. Uh, yeah, but they are part of the Shiism, not part of Sunnism. You know what I mean? If you go deeper into into this the this schism between the two the yeah. two sects, you can find it very well. By the way, I mean, in, in in a week time there is a discussion in the Parliament about the Shia and and, and the Sunni, you know, division in the in the Arab in the in the Arab world, especially in the Middle East. You know, is it, is it? Because it's it's very vital. It's very vital, and it's a fact. People try to ignore it. But speaking of facts, is it yeah. mathematically a fact when only five percent? Are, are Alawites, and then the statistics reveal more than 80% voted, be it for Mr. Assad or the other two candidates. So how could we say that he is voted by the Alawites, and that's why he is the, the, in the, for another the same, term? The same, the same, the same uh, you know, picture is, but the opposite one, in Bahrain. Mm -hmm. Who rules Bahrain? That the doesn't answer my Sunnis, question. <laughs> the, the minority Sunnis, mm -hmm. but the majority Shiite. You know? mm -hmm. In Syria, it's the opposite. You know? mm -hmm. It's the, the minority Shiite, the fact, majority Sunnis. This of is course, a problem. Of course. Well, as we speak about uh, Islamism and alternative rules in Syria, let's have a look at this exclusive Levant TV report uh, and see what the opposition had to say and why they boycotted the election. We hear nothing about the election. Here in the province of Hama, we don't have elections. We are completely boycotting the election. Voting in Hama is completely banned. What do you think of democracy and the election? Democracy is absolutely forbidden here. We go by the Sunni method only. There is no democracy here to allow women to dress the way they want or to have Alawites, Shia, and Druze contributing in making decisions in the government. That is completely forbidden in the Islamic Caliphate and the will of God, inshallah. Every person who tries to participate in the election will be strictly punished. We made some decisions a few days ago about this matter and those decisions are valid in Idlib and here in Hama. Do you know who the presidential candidates are? I don't know anything. You haven't heard of any of them? No, I haven't heard of any candidate or president. We are fighters in the name of God. We have no election here. These are all liberated areas. Look around you, the situation is good and stable. Here in rural Hama, we don't follow any government or anything. All we are looking for is to take down the regime and establish an Islamic caliphate. We don't care about a constitution or a law. The Quran is our constitution and nothing else. We will never participate in elections, not before the revolution and not after. Dr. Jamil, where do you think Syria would go with the opposition holding to radical beliefs, as we saw in this brief report, uh, undermining women's rights and undermining democracy in general, um, uh, rejecting the idea of democracy altogether? What do you think of this as an alternative to President Assad? When I highlight some points regarding the Syrian government, I'm not, in the meantime, you know, supporting or, or believing in what the other side is doing is correct. Mm -hmm. On the contrary, mm -hmm. I'm against these people, I'm against these groups who call themselves, you know, the army god or the blah, 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 you know, or the jihadists, you know. They are not on the right way anyway. But what I think is, this is what I said from the beginning, you know, although it's maybe too late, but I think with the new government now, if, he, if Assad tries to make a new government, to form a new government, he should make it inclusive. He should bring all the different types you know, around him, not necessarily Ba'athist or pro-Ba'athist, or, you know, or, or nationalists who believe in uh, you know, slogans you know, like, like, uh, you know, like, like the uh, nationalist or like the Nazarite or whatever. But I think he should include, he should invite, he can, he can you know, he can what? He can, he can, pull the carpet from underneath the, the, the mm -hmm. Islamists, the jihadists, you know. You can invite those moderate, if there are any moderates in them, you can invite them, include them in the government. He said, look, have a share. You okay? just sort of uh, dismissed them as an alternative or as a good alternative to, to the Assad's rule in Syria. However, they're you... They are not alternative. No. They, they aim to be. They or cannot. at least, how would the West support them then if they're known to be so radical? You see... You make me say something which I don't want to say. You don't have to. No, no. I, what I mean is, you see, if you look at the entire Middle East, what is going on now is a war between Saudi Arabia and the fundamentalists in Saudi Arabia and Iran, because it's Shiite. This is the major war between these two countries. Each one supports by a major power. You know, who supports Iran? It's Russia, because it has own interests in Syria or elsewhere in the Arab world. 
The United States has also its own interest. So what we are going to see, you see, if we look only at the Syrian conflict without looking around on the bigger picture, I think we are missing a lot. We have to look. We have to consider, you know, look at the, at the, at the major, you know, it's a jigsaw. We don't play with one piece. I think the whole picture is, should be in front of us so that we can decide. I think if the Americans now try to convince the Iranians that, look, we are going to give you this, we are going to give you this and that, huh? I think the Iranians will change position. And they might put pressure on Assad to have an inclusive government. Otherwise, otherwise, this is the game. This is mm -hmm. the we have to watch there, not to watch here. Mm -hmm. That's the point. And now we will talk to UK-based Syrian political activist Natalia Maki. Thank you very much for joining Straight Forward. As a young researcher, what do you think of the election in Syria yesterday and what do you think of the results today? Well, the election currently take, um, that took place in Syria will not unfortunately end the war and the suffering, but it represents a Syrian change in politics. There is no census for a political solution at the moment, and the greater powers are at conflict over the crisis. No election without full banking of all global forces and powers will succeed in ending the crisis and restoring peace and stability. However, for, for the first time in recent Syrian history, there is more than one part, more than one candidate, and people are free to vote. An election is still a way forward and is a good way to measure the popularity of the ruling system. Mm. Despite, despite the media pressure and the way people perceive the election, it is import, important to remember the final, decision is, the final decision was a Syrian one and the Syrian people have a legitimate right to elect whoever they deem suitable as president. Mm. Natalia, according to you or the youth that you believe uh, may share similar views, how would a new term for President Assad reassure you and in what sense? A new term for Assad has both positive and negative elements. The positives outweigh the negative. The country is in a state of war, a cycle of endless violence, and it is a tragedy on all levels. However, continuity breeds stability, and the Syrian people, and mainly the government supporters, view that President Assad can ensure a level of stability mm -hmm. and normality which no other leader can give at this moment. Mm -hmm. Timing is of the essence, and we can only take what was given from the elections and Assad will, would provide a level of experience with which no other person can give. Plus, he continues to enjoy significant levels of public support, which earmarks him as the best person to lead Syria, perhaps at this time. Mm. And uh, Natalia, as a Syrian who lives in the West, particularly in London, did you have any fears throughout the conflict throughout these three years? fears of a change in the socio-political structure in Syria under a possible strict Islamist rule? Well, as a Syrian citizen there, it's always a fear of, for the future of Syria. We were used to a secular country which was rich in social integrity and re rejection. We rejected extremism. Now extremism and terrorism is a big problem for Syria and Syrians. In places such as Raqqa, where fundamentalists are in control and social structure has been decimated, women have no rights. Executions, floggings, crucifixions are a daily torment to the people. Islamic extre extremists have exploited religion for political motives. And the big fear is that terrorism emanates from these groups such as al-Nusra, the Islamic State, Syria and Iraq, where they have a hardcore extremist ideology and impose their brutality and indoctrinate, indoctrinate methods on people. In mm. most parts of Syria, there, there are jihadist groups operating, which poses the question of how can Western affiliate Syrians live under such extreme laws. Mm -hmm. Natalia Mackey, thanks again for being our guest today. Thank you. Steve, how does the government here in the West, in, in England, assess the stance of the ethnic British youth on Syria? We've seen measures taken towards Brits going for jihad in Syria, even though it's in support of the opposition that the British government endorses. Uh, meanwhile, integrated peaceful British citizens, uh, Syrians, British Syrians like Natalia, for instance, and the opinion of the educated youth she represents are undermined for supporting President Assad, even though they are in no way pressured to do so because they live here. Uh, so it's a bit confusing. In what way could Britain's policy be explained? 
Well, I think um, through the mouth of the Queen, the British government said something deeply stupid this week when um, in the Queen's speech it was suggested um, that the primary source of terrorism in um, Syria was President Assad. And um, in reality, that's entirely in line with the British government's failure to understand what is actually happening and contrasts very seriously with what President Obama said in his speech when he said the primary danger now is the um, decentralization of Al-Qaeda um, and that you have an expression of that, obviously, in uh, the um, activity of the Islamic State of um, uh, Iraq and the Levant. Um, now, in terms of the uh, impact the British government's policy has had um, in uh, British society generally, and particularly amongst, I think, amongst Muslim uh, youth, I think it's been deeply alienating. Aside from the fact that one has seen consistent uh, preparedness to uh, engage in wars upon uh, Muslim countries, you've also seen Islamophobia, the isolation and um, uh, fear-mongering uh, about um, the uh, practice of uh, Muslims and their contribution to British society, that's become mainstream, unfortunately, amongst too many uh, British politicians. And I think we've seen uh, an expression of that uh, in recent uh, mm -hmm. days in terms of this um, witch hunt which is taking place um, in Birmingham amongst uh, 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 in uh, Muslim schools. Mm. We will get so, a little bit uh, yeah. into detail when it comes to foreign policy oh, sorry, on yeah. Syria as part of the next section of our debate. Now that President Assad has won another term, what's after the election? How is the result going to be perceived in the Middle East and the world? What is changing in the region? What are the lessons that the West could be learning? Saudi Arabia seems to have a shift of tone. John Kerry is in Beirut today. And in England's annual state opening of Parliament, the Queen touched on Syria. Stephen Bell, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, before we talk about the world reactions to, to the results of the elections, how huge is the impact on the youth in Syria who have witnessed this war? How important it is throughout the reconstruction, possibly when the conflict reaches an end, uh, during the reconstruction of Syria to re-establish a culture of coexistence which has been affected very negatively. I don't see how you can have a reconstruction until you've got a peace process which is all-inclusive. And that is the, the challenge. Again, that reasserts the need for the Geneva process to be addressed by all parties on the basis of no preconditions. You have to engage. And I think that the contribution that uh, the British government can make is exactly to ensure that um, the... Uh, it, it puts aside its flannel about aiding uh, Syria and it actually starts aiding uh, Syria by ensuring that there is a peace process and that um, it is prepared to put money up front if that process is successful to ensure that, um, a genuine uh, contribution to uh, the reconstruction. Because frankly, the involvement of British foreign policy mm -hmm. in uh, Syria has aided the destruction of Syria. Mm -hmm. And now let's talk to Syrian academic and political analyst, Dr. Isa Shaar. Thank you very much for joining Straight Forward. Thank you for having me. On Dr. Al Shaar, uh, while the West predicted Assad's victory in the election, one could also predict the reaction here in the West and the, in, uh, in the world in general towards his landslide victory. Why, in your opinion, is the West already delegitimizing this uh, election? There is a number of aspects. The West, from the beginning of the conflict, has taken sides with the rebels and have um, tried their best to undermine any uh, positive actions that comes from the uh, government side or from even the internal oppositions inside Syria or any moderate oppositions that are acting for the safety and uh, ca keeping the capability of the Syrian government and the establishment withholds. So the West is undermining any positive actions in the Middle East, in the region, trying to undermine the 
all of this defensive uh, uh, front between Lebanon, Syria, and Iran. Mm. And uh, given the change in Egypt and now in Syria, do you think, uh, Dr. Ashaar, uh, the U.S. and the West uh, will adopt another policy in Syria? Sorry, I, I could barely hear you. Could, could you say the questions again? Do you think the U.S. and the West have, will adopt another policy in Syria, especially given the results in the elections in Egypt and now in Syria? Do I think the West would, would change their policy, you mean? Uh, possibly. We're asking if, in your opinion, we don't need to speculate, but do you think there is a need for them to change their policy? Eventually, they will. Uh, I think what, what's happening is the uh, the, no, the, the normal citizens are now becoming more and more aware of the double standards or, and the, pol the double standard of the Western policies. And I think mm. this is going to grow, especially with the increase of um, extremists who are trying to, who are flying or who are moving from Western countries to Syria, being hardened in Syria, and mm. then creating a danger for Western countries. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's this argument now, the West only um, looks at their own interests. Yes. and have no interest in the Middle East apart mm. from looking at it from their own perspective. Stay with us, what Dr. al Shah. Uh, I, I, I will ask the same question uh, to Dr. Jamil here at the studio. Do you think the West should reapproach the, the Middle East, especially Syria now, in a different way? You see, if we talk about the, the, the West, I think uh, we mainly refer to uh, the United States. You know, this is the main player in the Middle East. For now. Uh, I think the influence of the United States in the Middle East is bigger than the influence of France or, or Germany or, or any other country, even Britain. Uh, but they work together, very closely together. Um, I think, I think the, the, now in the, in the United States there are circles, very important circles, even among Congress, you know, they, they uh, accuse Obama of being a little bit, uh, you know, giving in and then they try to, um, you know, give up the, the the strong American uh, picture of, 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 of America, you know, of he Uncle Sam. American exceptionalism, as Mr. Bell was yeah. saying a bit earlier. No, no, no you see, you see let, let, me, let, me, let me make my point clear. Mm. You see, the West, especially the United States, they will never change their policy just overnight for any reason. Um, that's why we see a consensus among, among the leaders of your European leaders that, you know, they condemned the results of the elections in Syria. Mm. I think they have almost a unified position regarding the results of the elections. Mm. However, as I said, you know, because it's a big game, any agreement between the United States and Russia, even the, regarding the Ukraine, maybe regarding uh, Iraq, maybe regarding Turkey, regarding any part of the world, any agreement with the Chinese, you know, any agreement with the Iranians might affect their mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why, you know, there is nothing as such as in the Arab world, they call it, they call it, you know, these are principles and we should not deviate. Mm -hmm. They believe in that. Mm -hmm. In the West, no, there are interests. If my interests go this way, I go that way, okay? I mean, I go the same way. So yes. we have to be very careful and we have to be not mm -hmm. to come from, I mean, to compare between how the Arabs feel or think and how the West think because they have more interest in the Middle East than the Middle East have interest in the, in the, in, in the West. Mm. So this is, this is the name of the game, I would say. Mm. Dr. Isa Shaar, how would you see Syria's relation with uh, Egypt under al-Sisi, especially now that President Assad is in for another term? I'm looking positively at this, and I think um, both the elections in Syria and the elections in Egypt have stemmed from almost the same views, the same beliefs. I think the return to national Arabism, the nationalism that Nasser had created back in the uh, 60s and the 70s, it's re-emerging again. Mm -hmm. And I think there will be a strike of stronger, stronger um, relationship between al-Sisi and uh, President Assad and or the Syrian government uh, as a whole. And I think because one, one main reason, both see 
the Muslim Brotherhood as the most dangerous groups on in the region and in the Middle East, and that they will take that as a threat to their existence. Mm. We, we have to also understand uh, it's the military that rules in both countries, and the, as long as this military see eye to eye, they will build up constructively mm. a relationship. Yes. Uh, and I think they, the people who would be uh, quite worried are all of the groups of Arab, Arab groups that have the new views about military. So yes. I think the Gulf will fear this coalition between Syria and probably Jordan might feel slightly threatened mm. by this mm. coalition between two military uh, strong strengths, that's Syria and uh, Egypt. Mm. Political analyst Dr. Isa Shahr of the Syrian Social Club here in London, thank you very much for being on Straightforward. Thank you for having me. Dr. Jamil, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry, on a visit to neighboring Lebanon, described the election in Syria today as, quote, meaningless. What's the significance that this may have and why in Lebanon particularly? Again, this is one manifestation of the, of the interest, of the American interest mm. in the Middle East, you know. Mm. I think what the Americans did, to be honest with you, I think they opened Pandora box. Mm. Maybe they were not aware that by having these changes, if they have a part in, you know, in all these changes in the Middle East, you know, the Arab Spring and the Arab Revolution, Arab whatever, you know, I think, I think they, they gave way to a power which was dormant. That is the Islamic power. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think uh, of course, supported by the by the you know, Saudi Wahhabis and by, the, by Turkey. On that and note, sorry to interrupt, yeah. I would yes. have to engage Mr. Bell. Uh, supporting the Wahhabis and supporting uh, radical groups, does the means, does the ends justify the means when it comes to US foreign policy nowadays? Well, you have to justify the end as well as the means. And in terms of what US foreign policy is, I think um, the uh, statement of um, uh, Kerry in um, the Lebanon was a, an expression of the impasse of American foreign policy. Um, they had a severe um, setback. Um, the world is, you, when the American government and the British government say they're going to bomb a country, usually that happens. Mm -hmm. And we saw a um, signal failure uh, last uh, summer. And since that time, you've seen an indication of the limits of American um, uh, power and the beginnings of some reorientation. This is obviously most notable in the um, negotiations with uh, Iran, which I do not think are simply a product of mm -hmm. um, the election of uh, President Rouhani. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that um, the very clumsy uh, attempts by uh, Kerry to re-engage uh, the peace process in uh, Palestine um, was part of that uh, uh, shift. And um, I also am very interested in this development vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran. Mm -hmm. I hope it's merely a clash in um, schedules that has uh, prevented um, Foreign Minister um, uh, Javed Zafir from actually taking up the invitation of the Saudis to uh, meet mm. because th that in itself would be a small contribution to a better atmosphere for um, the Geneva mm. uh, process. And um, I think if the Americans cannot simply by force uh, impose their will and that they are forced to use secondary channels, as, as it were, then exactly things happen which are well beyond their control. Yes. And I think that, so you are seeing a, a mm. new chapter emerging, in my mm. view. Mm. Let's talk now to Marco Gasic, international affairs commentator. Thank you very much for joining Straightforward. My pleasure. Marco, how does President Assad's landslide uh, victory in the election look like to you? Well, it, I mean, it looks to me like the uh, Syrian people, as we might imagine, are tired of war. They want their lives back, and they've given uh, now re-presidented Assad a mandate, which they didn't need to do. I mean, they could have uh, boycotted this election and humiliated him in, in, in that way, as many did in Ukraine. They could have uh, simply avoided the vote, but they turned up in huge number, and they're effectively saying that he's the man for the next step. He's their choice, and uh, 
we should respect uh, the people's decision. Uh, effectively, uh, let's get on with the peace process determined by the Syrian people instead of being uh, part of a war process which splits the Syrian people who then uh, take generations to recover from it. I think it is time for a bit of peace and I think that's what they voted for. Mm. Uh, Britain's Foreign Secretary uh, William Hague is uh, sceptical about the election and considered it not representative. Do you think this could be challenged and how? Hmm. Well, it's much, uh, the result for President Assad is much uh, better than the result that William Hague and David Cameron got in the last election here in the UK. And uh, it's better than Obama got in the last American election there. In both cases, they got about a quarter of the votes. And I think it's a similar case in Ukraine as well with the new, newly installed uh, president there. So really, on, on, on sheer grounds of logic, uh, it's obvious that uh, this is a valid uh, view by uh, the majority of the people in Syria. They voted for him. But I mean, we should really remember that the only democratic elections that uh, the West accepts really are those that bring uh, Western puppets to power. If you are an independent national figure, then your election will always be flawed. It'll always be a farce uh, in the eyes of the West. Uh, mm. But if you're it's uh, uh, the West, the West's puppet. Then you're on the uh, maybe on a step to the road to, to democracy. So it's really uh, different horses for different courses, as we say here. What we should see clearly is that, uh, unlike William Hague from the British electorate, Assad clearly has an overall endorsement, even at a time of war, uh, from his people. Yes. And we should remember he didn't even have to have an election at all, but uh, he chose to do so perhaps to send a signal of his willingness to embark on the journey of. Uh, democratic political change um, and we should remember that he's also previously declared his willingness to negotiate uh, with the Western backed opposition which they refused because they felt that the West backing them made them uh, certain to win rather than to uh, prepare to uh, negotiate instead so mm. all, all, in all counts on the commitment to peace or the commitment to a peaceful process a slow democratic change rather than a quick path to war I think this election should be approved of uh, provisionally, mm. but definitely approved of. Marco Gasic, international affairs commentator, thank you very much again for your contribution. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bell, uh, what's plan B for the West now? Well, I think the assumption from President Obama's speech is that they will, they will continue to grind bloodily on in um, supporting uh, an insurgency which is clearly failing. However, um, I do not believe that the American administration um, will allow this con to continue uh, indefinitely um, because you have the irony where someone like David Cameron was insisting a couple of years ago that Assad would be gone within months or weeks or Obama whatever. Obama insisted as well. He said yes. his days are numbered. This is quite uh, true. We don't know what number yeah, is that. Yeah, so. well, no, we don't. But what we do know is that Assad will be um, in power long after David Cameron uh, will be, um, judging by uh, developments in Britain. So I believe that there we are witnessing a change. Mm -hmm. I think that the um, election is a, a reassertion of the facts on the ground, the balance of real forces in Syria. I think that the American foreign policy establishment are capable of making a reorientation, mm -hmm. but for the moment um, the uh, Obama speech contained much that was genuinely depressing. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jamil, uh, by discrediting the election, is the West trying to gain time to assess what is happening in the Middle East, especially with the big turns in Egypt and now in Syria? That's very possible. That's very possible. I think uh, I agree that the Americans uh, you know, might change their policies you know, just all of a sudden, maybe. Mm -hmm. But I think, you see, what's, what's happening, you see, because if we look at the, at the, in, at the, at the map of the region, okay, what we see is that there are jihadists and, and Islamic uh, terrorists, let's call them, okay, who carry arms and try to initiate something. They try to, to, to force their own obsolete ideology on the, on the entire nations of, the, of these countries. And, uh, and that's why, you see, I think these jihadists, you know, especially now they are, you know, they are attracting more people from the West mm -hmm. as well, you know, and even the West is now becoming afraid because they think that the entire people, whether Syrian people, Iraqi people, or, or in, 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 in Lebanon, they have been taken like hostage by these 
by these uh, you know, armed people, armed, you know, the terrorists or the fundamentalists. And uh, because they have the weapon, they have the power, they have the force, so they can like, force people, you know, they can dictate on them any type of policy they want. And maneuver them. Yes. My point is now, you see, the major challenge to the United States and the West is not Assad and his regime, no, because he has been in power for such time, you know, and it was not a challenge. Why not? A, why now is a challenge? It's not him, but I think there might be a possibility, in my opinion, that Assad might remain in his, in his position, regardless of the, of the, of the description you, you described, the, the, the process, mm. the election process. But I think the main problem for the West, the main challenge for the West is, and the United States is, the rising power of the Islamist groups mm -hmm. in the Middle East. This is the danger, and this is a group. That's why I think, in my opinion, and you can quote me on that in, in a couple of years, that Saudi Arabia is the next target of the American onslaught in the Middle East. Quite a strong statement there. At, on this note, uh, this episode comes to an end. Let me thank our guests who joined us over the phone from Syria, Mr. Nidal Aisi and Mr. Declan Hayes. Dr. Declan Hayes, and from London, Natalia Mackey and Dr. Isa Shair and Mr. Michael Gasich. And of course, our guests here at the studio, Dr. Abdurrahman Jamil and Mr. Stephen Bell, thank you very much for coming. Stay tuned and I will be with you again soon on Straightforward and bye for now.